what what would happen if mayors would rule the world? Would they be able to solve the problems that the world is facing today? Would they be, they be able to address big problems like global warming or terrorism or anything else, big problems that leaders of na nation states are unable to solve? Tonight's guest, uh, Benjamin Barber think, thinks that they would, that these mayors would be able to make a change. Welcome to all of you. Welcome at this uh, special event. Um, welcome on behalf of Soeterbeek Programma. My name is Eliane Keulemans. I'm head of the Soeterbeek Programma. And I'm very glad to say welcome to you. Uh, we are happy that you have all come. First of all, I would like to address a special word of welcome to our guest of honor of tonight, Professor Benjamin Barber. Uh, we are very honored that he accepted our invitation to be with us in Nijmegen tonight. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Barber, for accepting our invitation. And also a special word of welcome to one of the people who, according to Benjamin Barber, could make a crucial difference when thinking about the future of the world. The mayor of Nijmegen, Hubert Bruls. Welcome, burgemeester. At first, um, I would like to um, introduce in a few words Professor Benjamin Barber to you. Barber, as you all know, is a world-renowned uh, political theorist. He is a professor of political science emeritus of Rutgers University, New Jersey. Professor Barber also is a public intellectual. He is engaged in many deba debates, and has always been, debates on the questions that have always fascinated him and that he has been thinking about all his life. Questions like uh, that have to do with uh, democracy, globalization, civil society, citizenship, and many more such items. Benjamin Barber also is a polit uh, political advisor, a, an advisor to uh, many organizations and also to politicians. And I think that Bill Clinton may be the most uh, well-known uh, person that uh, Barber has been able to uh, advise during the years. Benjamin Barber, and that may, may be uh, less well-known, um, is also a theater writer and director. He has been writing song lyrics and even a libretto for an opera. So there's many sides to him. Um, and last but not least, uh, Benjamin Barber is the writer of a great many books. I think that you are all familiar with uh, Jihad versus McWorld, a book uh, which was uh, which. Uh, which, which was translated in a great many languages, and I think which he became famous for really all over the world. And now, in 2013, he has written a book that uh, may have a fame uh, such as uh, uh, Jihad versus McWorld. Uh, Barber published this book, If Mares Ruled the World. And that's the book we are going to talk about uh, tonight. We are very happy that uh, uh, Professor Barber will give an introduction on that and that later on we will uh, discuss uh, the contents of this book. Tonight's program, um, Professor Barber will uh, lecture about uh, 45 minutes about this book um, and then you will meet André Zaslove who is an assistant professor of comparative politics at Radboud University. He will be the moderator of tonight and he will uh, ask some questions to Professor Barber, but not too many because Professor Barber has uh, indicated that he really would love to discuss with you, the audience. So afterwards there will be ample uh, possibility for you to ask questions and to uh, enter into a discussion with Benjamin Barber. 
We will have to end the evening at uh, about uh, three, uh, half past nine due to uh, a very busy schedule of Benjamin Barber. We'll ha we will have to end at that point in time. Uh, but you will have the opportunity to meet him for some time afterwards because uh, Professor Barber has uh, indicated that he is uh, willing to sign books afterwards. So if you would like to have your copy signed, uh, there will be a possibility afterwards. So far for the schedule, I'm very happy to introduce you, Professor Barber. The floor is yours. Take it with you. <laughs> I've read it. <laughs> Good evening, and uh, thank you very much for coming out on such a beautiful evening. If I was you, I would be out in the beautiful weather uh, rather than here. So you're very nice to come in and spend the evening uh, talking about some of the issues that we all face. I'm grateful to the Sudebeck uh, program for organizing this uh, evening, and I'm very gr grateful to uh, Mayor Bruce for, for showing up because one of the points I make in, a, in the book is that mayors are extraordinarily busy and later on I'll talk a little bit about, about my proposal for a global parliament of mayors and the toughest thing about that is getting mayors to find time to actually meet and try to do some issues that have to do with the whole world. Many have said to me, I haven't got the time to govern my own city and you want me to govern the world very difficult. So that he's taken the time to be with us, uh, I'm very grateful for, and you all know him, and I, I think you know that he's also a model. I don't even have to talk about the pragmatism of mayors, because Mayor Bruels is a model of a pragmatic mayor who is from a Christian Democrat party, but who in fact is widely supported, uh, I think, by many different people, because he does what mayors are supposed to do, which is actually make the city work. And what I'd like to talk about this evening with you is the way in which both mayors, cities, and the citizens of those cities are increasingly becoming the primary instrumentalities of an otherwise deficient democracy and are showing that they can solve not just the problems they face internally, but that they can also face problems across borders, the problem of a modern, interdependent, globalized world, problems that nation states simply are not facing. We start, in fact, this evening, and that's why I'm glad you're here, despite the beautiful weather, we start with the reality in Europe, in the United States, in the Middle East, in the Far East, with a world where democracy which here in the West we've experienced for four or five hundred years, is in deep crisis. That is my premise. And I think particularly for the young, for someone my age it may be in crisis, but you know I won't have to worry about that for so long. You're going to have to worry about it for 50 or 60 years, and your children and my grandchildren will be worrying about it far after that. We have become, particularly I think in this new millennium, rather complacent about democracy. The faculty, older members, will still remember the ravages of World War II, remember the costs that nationalism exacted from peoples who lived in the nation state. But for most people who are younger than 50, that's a distant memory. And if you're under 30, World War II, World War I, the Civil War, the French Revolution, they all kind of fade into the past, something that perhaps a grandfather experience, but not more. But the reality is democracy and the democratic nation state have been in crisis really since the beginning, not of this century, but the beginning of the last century. You know well from your studies that the nation state system was invented in the 16th and 17th century, the so-called Westphalian system after the peace of Westphalia to allow democracy to survive at the new scale of national territories, of national peoples. The old city-state of the ancient world, the principalities and townships of the early modern era, 
though in many ways successful political and civic institutions, were insufficient to the growing size and scale of peoples and territories. And there was a real danger in the early modern period that we would simply lose democracy, that the new monarchies, the new empires would take over and leave democracy behind. But the idea of a nation state, a state representing a whole people on an integral territory, rooted in natural law and conceived through a social contract, which gave the legitimacy of the state, the authority of a founding people, that idea, a brilliant idea, rescued democracy from scale and allowed us for the last three or 400 years to deal with most of the problems that everyday life brings forth. From about 1600 to about 1914, some would even say to 1945, almost every problem we face, the economy, disease, crime, immigration, capital, they were all functions of national territories. And so a sovereign national state was in a position to deal effectively with them. By 1914, that was beginning to change. Trade relations had gone from 5 or 6% of gross national product to 15%. And after World War II, it had become clear that the nation states that for 400 years had secured democracy and secured their peoples increasingly was becoming the instrument of their destruction. And World War II, in particular, something that people who live in this city so close to the German border know very well, didn't secure and protect the liberty and freedom of its people, but destroyed its peace people in an orgy of mutual slaughter. And so at the end of World War II, the 400-year-old nation state was seen as in some ways exhausted, some ways insufficient to the new problems of a globalizing, interdependent world. And a great European named Jean Monnet, during the war actually, had the notion and said clearly that sovereign nation states can no longer be the foundation for security or liberty for a people. And that some other institution was needed and his brilliant invention was the idea of pooling sovereignty, erasing national borders, and creating a European community. Initially, it was a community in steel and coal. Then it became an economic community. And in time, the idea of Europe as both a fiscal and Euro community, but also a Europe of Europeans, where sovereignty was pooled, where national borders no longer stopped the movement of labor and capital across borders, became a commonplace. And for a while, it seemed that perhaps Europe had solved the problem of nation states by pooling their sovereignty in this larger entity that permitted cooperation and reciprocity among states that for centuries had been at war with one another. And it is no small thing, and again, those of us who are older will appreciate it perhaps more than those who are younger, that Europe has lived for the last 70 years or more in peace in a way that in the 400 years before that simply was not possible. But we know in that same world, though there was peace within Europe, as Europe eliminated the walls between European states, it built new walls and new boundaries between Europe and the world. And if you doubt that, ask yourself why Turkey is not a member of Europe today. Ask yourself why at the end of the Cold War with the dismantling of the Soviet Union, NATO got bigger and moved east rather than dismantling along with the enemy that had been conceived to overcome. Ask why today in Ukraine and Russia there are hints of a new war, cold rather than hot, but very real, a war that looks more like it might be happening in 1840 than in 2015. And then, of course, beyond the borders of Europe, the world is still defined by national hostility, national competition. At this very moment, the Japanese and the Chinese navies are stalking one another in the Pacific Ocean. And we are watching the growth of hostilities all over the world between nations and within nations, 
in ways that not only put security at peril, but also put the democracy that nation states were supposed to protect at peril. And worst of all, perhaps, here in Europe and in the United States and in Japan and in the so-called developed democracies that have been around for a long time, citizens are losing faith in democracy itself. You all know, and I will predict it again here, that next month in the European elections, the right-wing populist anti-European reactionary parties will win far more votes than they have ever won before. And that's not because they're villains or terrible people, it's because the politics of fear has swallowed up the politics of hope. Because many poor Europeans, many old Europeans, see in Europe now a bureaucratic adversary, not a friend of their own participation. And so they do what people in fear do, they look for victims, they look for someone to blame. And so foreigners, or Europe, or Muslims, become those who are blamed for their problems, their economic difficulties, and so on. But the rise of the far right in Europe, the populist right, is in no small part due to the failure of the democratic left to actually create a Europe that is about Europeans as well as the Euro, that is about social welfare as well as austerity politics to protect the investment of the banks. So the great experiment in democracy represented by three or 400 years of the nation state and by Europe is itself in jeopardy, indicated not just by these problems, but by the fact that many people who have the vote, that vote for which people are still dying to obtain in Egypt and elsewhere, don't exercise it. Only about half the population in Europe votes even in the big election, as you know here in Holland in municipal and local elections where some people think not much is at stake because mayors are not elected by their own constituents, something like 15% of people vote. You can see people in Tahir Square asking themselves, why are we dying to get a vote that the Europeans who have had it for centuries don't bother to use? In the United States, about 52% of Americans vote in presidential elections, and the numbers go way down in interim elections and congressional elections and local elections. And when you scale that by age, the younger, and the more people are people of color and minorities, the less they vote. Those who most need the vote, vote the least. And we now have political parties working hard to make sure those who would like to vote more don't vote more. Repressive election laws. So if you're a young man or a young woman in Tripoli, or in Alexandria, or in Damascus, thinking about freedom, thinking about what it might mean to be democracy, and then you look at what is happening in the old democracies, no wonder perhaps you shake your head and say, well, maybe we'll bring the military back and let them solve the problems, or maybe we'll keep Assad and let him repress the far uh, extreme religious parties, because the people who invented democracy don't believe in it anymore. Why should we practice it? Why should we forfeit our lives to do it? So, I know it's a dismal message, but the message is that democracy is in deep trouble. And I suspect those who are here, because they are here, are a unrepresentative sample of the Dutch people. Just by virtue of the fact that you're here and interested in thinking about this, and you might think, well, that's not fair, this doesn't apply to us. It probably doesn't apply to you, but it applies to the majority of the Dutch, the German, the Italian the Spanish public. And those who are politically active are increasingly active by throwing firebombs and throwing stones at the police and cursing the central banks that are bankrupting their local states and asking them to pay off debt rather than to pay for social services. And it's no wonder that people of color, young people, people out of work, ask, why are you robbing me of benchmark social services in order to assure interest for the banks that made loans to us? Why is Europe organized to protect the banks, not to protect social welfare of its peoples? And then you begin to get the picture maybe of why people, when they vote, vote against, not for Europe. Vote for the parties that do a rhetoric of fear 
a rhetoric of hatred, a rhetoric of exclusion. And we saw it before, go back to the 1920s and the 1930s and see a German people felt they were dealt a hard blow. They were made the sole ones responsible for World War I. They were made to pay the reparations and the consequences that had with National Socialism. Which, by the way, like populism here, remember it was National Socialism. The Nazis were socialists. They believed in welfare for the people. The Aryan people, but the people. And a lot of right-wing populists are socialists of a kind. They really want to see people served, but they think people can't be served because there are too many foreigners, too many Muslims, too many bureaucrats, too many technocrats who stand in the way. And so they vote against foreigners. They vote against Europe. They vote against the technocratic bureaucracies that think in Brussels they are finding good ways to serve Europe's peoples or the peoples they serve just don't see it that way. A pretty dismal picture, I know. But actually, the book I wrote, If Mayors Ruled the World, is a hopeful book, is an optimistic book. And having set out this scenario that I know is making you think, maybe I should go to the movies tonight or go out and take a walk in the beautiful spring evening, let me suggest that I think there is a way to begin to address these problems. And it's a rather simple way. If I can put it in the simplest way of all, I would say, let's change the subject. Let's stop talking about nation states or Europe and start talking again about cities. Let's stop talking about prime ministers and presidents and let's start talking about mayors and city councilors. Let's stop talking about those passive spectator citizens who watch national elections on television, and that's called democracy, and start talking about engaged citizens in neighborhoods, in local parent-teacher associations, in local civil society, who are engaged in participatory budgeting and participatory zoning, who see themselves as neighbors in neighborhoods where self-government means involvement, not just by the mayor and counselors, but of citizens at large. If we start looking at that picture, even in Holland where mayors are not directly elected, they have democratic legitimacy. The councils and the national government which are elected are involved in choosing them. But even here, mayors are so much more democratic, so much more representative, so much more engaged than at the national level. In other words, if we change the subject from states to cities, from prime ministers to mayors, a much more optimistic view of the possibilities of democracy and democratic governance emerges. You were nice enough in introducing me to introduce me in terms of a book that said, could mayors, should mayors, is it possible that mayors would rule the world? Actually, the old subtitle of my book was, if mayors ruled the world, why they should and how they already do because the point of the book is that they actually already are engaged, not just in meaningful, effective governance locally, but through intercity associations, through cooperation across borders, through old organizations like UCLG and new ones like the C40 are engaged together in solving global problems. It's not just a question, could they deal better with climate change than nation states? You bet they could, they are, they do, every day. And I'll give you in a minute some examples of how that works. So I don't come to you this evening as a whimpering idealist saying, oh, wouldn't it be nice if somehow mayors could do something? I come to tell you as a social science realist that that is what's happening. And what I want to do is exploit the reality not fully recognized of how effective municipal government is how effective mayors are as problem-solving pragmatists at actually making a difference and getting things done as compared to national politicians locked up in ideological conflict, government gridlock. We like to think of ourselves, me too, as an old-time idealist, as someone, I will stand here on principle and I won't move, I won't compromise until I get my way. And if that means closing down the government, that's just fine. Well, we've had a lot of experience with that in the United States. 
principled ideologues who said it's much more important to stand on principle than have the United States government open for business. And twice now in the last couple of years, they closed the national government down. What's astonishing, though, is to some extent nobody noticed because we're so used to a national government that doesn't do very much in the way of everyday governance that when it closes, you don't notice the difference. Imagine for a minute closing Amsterdam, closing Louvain, closing Lille, closing Lyon, closing Dusseldorf. You can't close a city for five minutes, let alone for a day or a week or a month. Cities have never closed, not all the way back to the Middle Ages, during plague, during siege. Cities have to go on picking up the garbage, treating the sick, schooling the children, resolving and adjudicating conflicts with the police department, fighting fires with the fire department, providing sewage, getting the snow off the roads, keeping the buses or the carts moving. That's what cities are about. That's what they do. And that's because cities are not just another level of governance. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Brussels at a meeting on the future of Euro cities, and a European commissioner said, with all goodwill, he said, yes, I think it's, we should definitely consider cities. You know, they're another level of governance we have to think about, another level of public administration. Really? the place where you were born, where your parents might be born, where you grow up, where you have a job, where you work, where you go to school, where you go to the university, where you pray and you play, where you grow old and get sick and where you die. That's just another level of administration, like a département at the medium level or a region. The city is the oldest human community on earth and it defines us as human beings when Aristotle said, man is a political animal, zuon politikon, he was talking about the cities. When Marx said, man is a species being that lives together, he was thinking and talking about cities. No cities, no capital, no production. No cities, no culture, no art. No cities, no religious communities, no churches and mosques and temples. Cities help define us as human beings and who we are. They are not just another level of administration. And one of the reasons I argue in the book that cities are so very important in how we govern ourselves democratically is that they are so much more than another level of organization. They have to work because cities are us. Cities are about who we are. Cities are neighborhoods and townships they're about our human associations. They're about civil society. That's why when terrorists want to wreck a civilization, they don't attack the farms, the villages. They attack the cities and the great symbols of the cities, the tall buildings, the churches. They want to destroy civilization by destroying the city. The very word citizen, citoyen, and city, cité, the same etymology. The very idea of citizenship grows out of our residency, our inhabiting cities. Cities were the first human communities, the first democracies, the great cities of the ancient Mediterranean, the Hansa cities of the North Sea, the principalities and cities of Italy and Germany in the middle and early New Age, the early Renaissance. Those all represented the fundamental human habitation. And what happened in the story I told you a little earlier, and you know what happened is that in the age of the 15th and 16th and 17th century, we found those cities vital as they were to our humanity and our community, inadequate to the needs of governance. And so we upped the ante, we created these larger territorial states, this notion of la nation, le peuple, das Volk, which was a complete invention. The German people, excuse me, Himmler, really? Mr. Goebbels, the German people? You can talk about Frankfurt, you can talk about Berlin, you can talk about regions. The German people is an invention. The French people is an invention. Joan of Arc helped invent it by trying to unite France against the English. 
And right away, the very birth of the nation was involved in wars against other nations. The Dutch Empire was built on a Dutch Republic, which was built on a great city like Amsterdam, a free city of Amsterdam. And isn't that amazing that just 400 years ago, the Dutch had one of the great economic empires of the early modern era, rooted in a free trading city. That's extraordinary. That was the power of the city. And the new America in the colonial era was what? Yes, it was some cotton plantations in the South, but it was Philadelphia. It was New York, New Amsterdam then. It was Boston. It was these early human communities around which the new American man, as Crevecoeur called him, was formed. Cities are older than the states they belong to. Damascus older than Syria, Cairo older than Egypt, Beijing older than China, Boston and Philadelphia older than the United States. And certainly the cities of this great nation of cities are older than either Holland or the Niederlande. So cities are so absolutely crucial, and it's odd in a way that we've forgotten how vital they are to us. And part of what I've done in this book is say, let's hold up the flag of cities again against the flag of nations. Let's remember what cities do for us, and then, and then let's remember the virtues of cities and the virtues of those who rule them, because it turns out the virtues of cities and the virtues of those who rule them are the very values we need, the very public goods we need in a globalized interdependent world. And just to take an example again, thinking about Amsterdam or New York. Nation states by definition, that's what nation, national state means, état nation, are monocultural. They're built around a single culture, that's the whole point. The Japanese nation, the Chinese nation, the Mexican nation, the Dutch nation, the Belgium nation. Cities are built around exchange, relationships, and multiculturalism. Diversity is not something new in cities. It goes all the way back because cities have always been about trading and exchange and interactivities. So of course cities are diverse. Traders move in and out, goods come and go, nomads cross over. Why is it that so many cities, it's almost 90% of cities are built on water? Lakes, rivers, streams, seas, oceans. Because of course the water is the great global crossroads of the ancient and the modern world. Cities are built to interact with others. That's why the Hansa and the Mediterranean League of the ancient world were in these cities around the water, around the seas. States are built to be bounded by walls, territories, and borders to protect themselves from other states that abut them. And that turns states into a competition that is, in technical languages, you know this term, a zero-sum game. Any poll today will tell you, and any Belgium will tell you, that when Germany gets larger and more powerful, Poland and Belgium get smaller and less powerful. It is a zero-sum game when it comes to nation states. But guess what? Brussels, Berlin, and Warsaw can all flourish and get stronger and more interesting and more connected at the same time. A strong and prosperous and cultural Berlin does not exclude a strong and prosperous and cultural Warsaw. Russia and Ukraine will argue about the eastern Ukraine and the Crimea, which is populated primarily by Russian speakers but has a large minority of Ukrainian speakers around old 19th and 18th century nationality issues. But in their everyday life, do you think the people of Sebastopol or Kiev or Moscow care about those things? Pick up my garbage the Ukrainian way, please. Not in the Russian way. Picking up the garbage is something you have to do in every city everywhere. Keeping the sewers running is something you have to do everywhere. Having buses, subways, the metro run having jobs for everybody, having hospitals for the sick, having places of worship open to all. 
Those are functions of every single city in the world, regardless of which nationality they belong to. And the sad thing about Ukraine and Russia today is that they are pushing people out of their urban cosmopolitan identities back into old, ancient, quarreling nationalist identities based on contrivance. Other than the language they speak, can anyone really tell me the difference between a Ukrainian, a Crimean, and a Russian? when it comes to the jobs they do, the way they're educated, how they get married and what they do. Those are artificial identities, but there are deadly identities and once we assume them, you're willing not just to die for it, but you're willing to kill for it. And that takes us right back where we were before the end of World War II, with nationality as a form of deadly competition. Zero sum game, expansion and diminution, someone bigger, someone smaller. Aryans, Jews, today, Muslims, Christians, same thing. But if you go to Rotterdam today where there is a mayor of Moroccan origin who's a Muslim, but where what's interesting is that that's not a great sign of tolerance. Okay, finally we're going to have a Muslim mayor. It's because a very smart, effective guy who did a very good job became mayor and he happened to be a Muslim and that was really secondary and incidental to what he did. That's what cities do. Cities are not open and tolerant simply because they say, okay, I'm going to swallow hard and accept that a Muslim or a man of color can live here. It's because those things simply don't matter. Being an inventor, being an entrepreneur, and being an artist have nothing to do with the color of your skin or the language you speak or your ethnicity. It has to do with these urban functions that define us as human. And that's why from the beginning of time to today, people from all over, particularly people who are different, flock to the cities. Young people who are gay or transgender, people of color living in societies that are oppressive. Muslims who are oppressed in their own society come to places like this where they also get oppressed, unfortunately, but they feel less oppressed. They feel more possibility. Because that's what cities do. That's what the urban environment makes possible. And that's the great strength and virtue of cities. And we need a world that looks like and operates like and lives in accord with the values and virtues of cities. And that's why I argue in the book then that mayors ought to govern the world, not in some vague metaphoric sense, but literally in a global parliament of mayors. Uh, united mayors, which unlike the United Nations, which are really the disunited nations, allows for real cooperation around common problem solving. And it also means a world in which not just mayors should rule and cooperate, but are already doing so. Let me take as an example of what I'm talking about climate change. We all know we've been watching for, since the beginning of the COP process the UN process to create climate standards and starting five years ago in Copenhagen when 184 nations came together and met and talked about how can we improve on Kyoto. And after two weeks, those 140, 84 nations went home explaining that their sovereignty did not permit them to do anything. And every year since then on an annual basis, those same nations meet and explain all over again why nothing's possible. And meanwhile, the world moves towards not nuclear catastrophe or terroristic catastrophe, but ecological catastrophe. What will make your survival 50 or 100 years from now and that of your children most problematic is not war, not terrorism, but climate change. Three, four rise, meters rise in the oceans and something like 50% of the human population is inundated and most of our cities gone. I needn't tell you here in the Netherlands that already below sea level what six meters can mean to this country. Bangladesh, half of that whole country of tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people is below sea level. 90% of cities are on water. Climate change is a disaster for the human race and the nation states that have responsibility for dealing with the future of disasters and protect us with a sustainable future look the other way and say sorry. Nothing we can do. 
and then tip their hats to the carbon industry and the oil industry, which are paying their way and explaining why it's so much more economical and so much more profitable to sell carbon, to take carbon out of the earth and put it in your engines, put it in your factories, put it in your cars. Unfortunately, once it's done helping us move and move machines, the methane and the carbon goes up into the atmosphere as greenhouse gases, and the process continues. But the nation states we elect to protect us and sustain us do nothing, and mayors know better. And interestingly, the mayor of Copenhagen five years ago at the Copenhagen meetings was actually a former environmentalist. She had been mayor of Copenhagen, then she was the environmental minister, and she gave up the environmental ministry of the Danish national government because she said, they're not doing anything. And she went back to Copenhagen, and she was the mayor, and when the first meetings happened there, and those 184 nation states came, she invited 200 mayors. Said, why don't you come in, we'll talk too. And when the prime ministers and presidents all went home shaking their heads saying, too bad, the mayors stayed. And in fact, cities have been working already around issues of climate change for many, many years with older organizations like ICLE and new organizations like the C40, which is now 65 very large cities that are cooperating together and that have pledged themselves to reducing carbon emissions by 10 or 15% a year, like the Covenant of Mayors, this European organization that is committed to reduction while states are doing nothing. And cities are, it's not just they make the pledge, they do it. The, good, the bad good news slash is that 80% of carbon emissions come from cities. That's bad. But what's good is that means 80% of carbon emissions have, can be dealt with by cities, by mayors, by their city councils, by citizens, by business. Cities can actually make a huge change in carbon emissions and in the Covenant of Mayors, and in the C40, and in ICLE, they have pledged to do just that, and thank God they are doing that. Not enough, but given that nation states are doing nothing, they are doing really important things. And I'll just give you three examples of what cities can do, even on their own. And you can think of many others and suggest that also there are many different ways. It's not that every city does the same thing. Different cities have different issues and different problems, but in Los Angeles, which is, not so many people know this, it's the largest port city in the United States. It's larger than Houston, larger than Norfolk, larger than Boston. It's our biggest port. And it turns out that 40% of ga greenhouse gases come from the port of Los Angeles. Why? Because hundreds of ships come in and out with their diesel engines every day, and they sit at bay and at the dockside and they load and unload and their diesel engines idle. You know, they're like the old big buses used to do in trucks and the gas spews out. Days at a time, their diesel engines idle like that. And every day, 12,000 lorries come in and out of the port to load and offload with their gasoline engines and they too idle and while they're loading and offloading. So that 40% of the carbon emissions of Los Angeles come just from that source. And Mayor Villaraigosa, who was the mayor in the uh, early 2000s and through just recently, said, we've got to make a difference. We can't wait. We've got to do something about that because of not just greenhouse gases, but pollution, particulate pollution and so forth comes with that as well. So he set out to green up the port. It's responsible for 40% of the carbon emissions. And he did two rather simple, complicated things that he had to do with the help of business, with the help of civic organizations, with the help of companies. Number one, he says, he looked at the yacht clubs in Los Angeles. He said, when the yachts come in, the guys who own the yachts don't keep their engines running all night to have the lights and so on. You've seen it. You see it here in Rotterdam and Amsterdam. They plug in. They go electric, and they turn off their engines. So Villaray goes and said, we're gonna have a regulation. Any ship that comes in here, when it loads and offloads during the three or four days in port has to turn off its engine, and we will help them develop a large, you know, it's not a plug like this, it's a plug like this for the big ships. They'll plug in, they'll be on electricity the whole time they're loading and unloading, no diesel engines. And then those 12,000 lorries coming in every day, we will develop a program, and he got a local trucker to do a model, a hybrid engine, 
to cut pollution by about 90% because it was a hybrid engine. And he required any truck and lorry that wants to come in to the port has to have that hybrid engine in it. And it took five years to do, but when he was done at the end of five years, he had cut the carbon emissions, the greenhouse gases, by 50% in the port. And that's 20% of carbon emissions in Los Angeles. And the mayor and business and the citizens did that themselves. He asked, by the way, he asked for help from Obama in the beginning. And Obama said, I can't get anything done myself here in Washington. You think I can help you? Sorry. You're on your own. And that's been repeated in place after place. In New York, it's not so much the poor. We don't use so many cars. It's a very dense city. But we have the oldest whole housing and residential and building stock in the world. And it leaks. It's badly insulated. 10% of the energy for air conditioning and heat leaks out of the buildings. So that's 10% of the energy and 10% of the emissions that go with the energy that's a complete waste. So Mayor Bloomberg said, we will introduce new standards. We will retrofit old buildings and insulate them. And we will require that new buildings have much higher standards. And on top of that, he said, let's paint all the roofs white. Because all that black tar paper attracts sun in the summer and makes air conditioning much less efficient. And he did that over three or four years. And he has cut energy use by 7 or 8% in New York that way. And that's a 7 or 8% reduction in the emissions that are associated with the energy not being expended. So there's a lot cities can do one by one. In Bogota, what they did there, the cars were the big problem. There's a public transportation system, buses, but the buses share the streets with trucks and lorries and cars and bicycles and pedestrians and chickens and pigs. So the buses took three hours to cross Bogota. And they idled a lot of the time, too. So he designed a system that a number of Latin American countries have done now with a dedicated traffic lane with a curb on either side for buses only. And like a subway, like a metro, he had stops only every three or four blocks. You couldn't get on just every block. You had to walk a little bit to get on. The result is... Buses that originally took three hours to cross Bogota, crossed Bogota in 45 minutes. Emissions were cut way down. And as a side effect, people who live in the favelas and come into town to work were spending only an hour and a half coming and going to work instead of five or six hours, getting up in the middle of the night to get jobs. So it actually helped the employment situation because more people from the favelas were able efficiently to get to their jobs. And all of this in these three different cities in three very different ways allowed cities to have a serious impact on carbon emissions. Now amaze, imagine what happens when cities begin to work together, share best practices, help each other do this. How much impact you can have on carbon emissions when 80% of them come from, come from cities. It's a big deal. And to the extent there has been a slowdown in greenhouse emissions, and there has, it's largely the result of what is going on in the cities because, in fact, as we know, in China and the developed world, more and more emissions are happening because they're trying to catch up with the West, and the West won't pay to help them with alternative energy. And they say, well, you did it in the 19th and 20th century. We're going to do it in the 21st century. So nation states are part of the problem. Cities are part of the solution. And the same thing can be shown to happen over and over again in almost any realm you think about. Not the easy, people often say, well, cities, that's easy. Picking up the garbage, anybody can do that. But the hard, tough issues. Well, the hard, tough issues like greenhouse gases, cities are contributing to. Another very hard issue is immigration where nation states, again, have totally failed. Europe has failed. The Schengen Agreement created a system of appropriate immigration and visas and so on. America has a very tough border system that requires you to cross legally or you can't cross. Uh-huh. Right. It's so good how well it works. Because of the Schengen Agreement, there are no illegal immigrants in Europe. It's terrific. An American immigration policy looks so good that there are no illegal immigrants in America. Right. There are 12 million undocumented workers in the United States. 12 million. 
That's two-thirds of the Dutch population. There are millions and millions of illegal immigrants here. And why? Not because they're villains or criminals, but because immigrants follow the logic of the economy. They cross borders to where their jobs are because the global market is not a bordered world of nations. The global market is a marketplace without borders, and immigrants go where their jobs are. So here they come up from sub-Saharan Africa into Morocco, cross into Spain illegally, and then from Spain they find their way into the European community and are everywhere. And states, the United States and Europe says, says one of two things is, no, no, they're not there. They're not allowed in. Or it simply looks the other way. But if you're a mayor, you live in a city and you know, because some commit crime, some of their children end up in the hospitals, they're in schools, you know very well that you, many of your citizens and your residents are not here legally. They don't have a Schengen visa, they're not members, they're not citizens technically. But they are here and their children go to school and they get sick and they hold jobs. Often they don't pay taxes though because they're off the rolls. And they can't live in decent housing because they can't expose who they are. And when they commit crimes, it's hard to track them down because the police don't know who they are or what they are because they're not legal. So mayors have begun to do what states won't do, which is face the truth that an awful lot of the movement of workers around the world has nothing to do with the immigration laws, but follows the logic of the economy, and said, we will recognize them. We will offer you an urban visa, a city visa. Mayor Schultz in Hamburg has been doing that for quite a while. Mayor Vandelan has been thinking about how he can give official residency to people who are there, quote, illegally. Mayor de Blasio, the new mayor of New York, intends to give out city ID cards to people who are nonetheless there illegally. California, actually, even in California cities, offer driver's licenses because they drive. And if they drive, better they have a driver's license and you can watch and see what they do than that they drive illegally. Mayors are realists, which makes them very good pragmatic rulers. They deal with the real problems that are there. National politicians say they shouldn't be there, and so they're not. I'll just look the other way. So in the area of immigration, again, cities are beginning to take hold and deal with these very real problems. Even in the area of security, cities are doing things that nations aren't. We think of, we always say national security. That's a, that, that's a issue for nation states. That's a hard one. Cities can't do that. Well, you know what? Nation states maintain armies and navies and air forces that are about at best 100 years old and at worst 300 years old to fight wars that nobody wages anymore. The United States is still ready to do battle with the Soviet Union. Unfortunately, there's no more Soviet Union. And Russia under Putin may be taking territory, but what are, what are you going to do, send a B-1 bomber to bomb him? when the Crimea decides to stay with Russia or Eastern Ukraine does that? When was the last war between states, real war between states? Probably World War II. All the wars since then are civil wars, insurgencies, terrorist wars, tribal wars, internal wars, insurgencies. And for those wars, America is ill-equipped, most nations are ill-equipped, the United States has 10 carrier groups, aircraft carrier groups, 10 aircraft carrier groups, and enough firepower on those aircraft carriers to destroy any nation on Earth. However, it can do nothing with a suicide bomber. It can do nothing with a few people who hijack an airplane and run it into a building. That's not the kind of war it was made to fight. So we have these old nation state armies in a new form of war, and guess what? Cities are much better positioned in a war against terrorists, in a war against a interdependent, malicious, non-governmental organization like Al-Qaeda. The most important weapon is intelligence. You gotta know what they're doing. They don't, have, they don't represent a lot of firepower, but because they come secretly, because we don't expect them, they can come with bombs, they can come with air airplanes and do a lot of damage. So intelligence is crucial. And it turns out that nation state intelligence isn't very good at tracking them. You might have seen the story a day or two ago about a massive meeting of Al-Qaeda in Yemen. 
with all the major leaders, including the number two guy. And they were there for two days meeting. And afterwards, United States intelligence forces and European intelligence forces, oh, we didn't know they were there. If we had, maybe we could have dropped a drone on them and done some damage. But we didn't know they were there. Well, the NSA was too busy looking, listening to your cell phones, probably, to pay too much attention to what was happening in Yemen. But the fact is, intelligence is crucial. And guess what? Cities are increasingly doing city-to-city -city intelligence. New York City has 12 or 15 of the best intelligence detectives in the world. Right after 9-11, Mayor Giuliani sent them to Washington, and after a year or two, they came back, and they said, there's no intelligence in Washington. We're learning nothing. The FBI doesn't talk to the CIA. Neither of them talked to Interpol. We're not getting much information. By then, Bloomberg was the mayor, and Ray Kelly was the police commissioner, and they said, I have a better idea. Let's send one detective to Frankfurt, one to Hong Kong, one to Rio, one to London, one to Tokyo. Let's do city-to-city -city intelligence sharing. And one reason New York, despite the fact that it remains the number one target of terrorists of every kind everywhere, has been relatively safe in these years is because intelligence has been so strong, because it's been city-to-city -city intelligence that bypasses Washington and bypasses the other national capitals. On the other side of that, the negative story is that the Boston Marathon bombing, which was just a year ago from yesterday, it was caused by two guys who go back to Russia regularly and who the Moscow police had dossiers on and knew they were dangerous and potential terrorists. And the Moscow police actually told the FBI. Unfortunately, the FBI forgot to tell the Boston police about them, even though they knew they lived in Boston. Had Boston had an intelligence detective in Moscow, they would have shared that information. It's very possible they would have been able to preempt the marathon bombing simply by sharing intelligence. So even in areas as difficult and seemingly national as security, as terrorism, cities have a large and important role to play. This is not an argument that cities will replace nation states. Nation states aren't going away. The 10 American carrier groups will continue to circle the world doing very little. But cities have an increasingly large and important role to play, and they are playing that role. And my argument in the book is that they shouldn't just do what they are doing one by one and together. They should begin to work together in a global, a new global governing infrastructure, a global parliament of mayors, in which mayors come together not to make laws and tell the world's people, these are the laws you have to obey now, but by sharing best practices, by opting into good practices, by doing things together that they're now doing alone, with the weight of their numbers, and half the world's population is now in cities, and in the West, in the developed world, it's 80% of the world's population are in cities. They will be able, through simply doing it, to have a profound effect on governance, change how we do business, help nation states do the things that nation states are very bad at doing add a level of governance to the governance infrastructure which will restore some hope in democracy. Because we live in a global interdependent world and unless we either globalize democracy or democratize globalization, we're gonna lose democracy. And a global parliament of mayors can do that. It can make that difference at the global level. So you will find here then an argument, not an argument that says cities are wonderful and states are awful, on the contrary, an argument that says nation states have played a vital role as a primary instrument of government at the larger scale of national societies since the 16th century, but today we live in a global world whose scale is larger than nation states, and we need to go back to cities in order to go forward to Cosmos, back to the polis to go forward to Cosmopolis, to go forward to a union of cities, an assembly of cities that together with their pragmatism, their knowledge, their ability to solve problems, can, no, not by themselves solve all the world's problems, but contribute to it in a powerful way and make a difference in how we view democracy, make a difference in the hope we feel, and bring back to a world where so many people are cynical about democracy, about government itself, bring back the sense that government can work not only city by city, but can work for the globe when cities have a more significant role to play in that governance. 
That is the promise of cities in an interdependent world. Thank you very much. Thank you.